Welcome back to Tightwad Workshop. Today we're going to make some chain mail from old wire coat hangers. We'll start by making a mandrel, which we'll use to coil the wire into a spring. I'll drill an 8mm hole into this piece of hardwood. Now I'll screw this 9.5mm bolt into the hole. I'll clamp the hardwood to the workbench with a pair of our homemade hand screw clamps. Yep, that's not going anywhere. Now we need to saw the head off the bolt. You'll see why in a moment. Use a file to take off any sharp edges. Next I'll drill a small hole in the hardwood that we can use to anchor the wire. Start by making a bend in the end of the wire. Then put the bent end in the anchor hole. Now coil the wire around the mandrel. These kinks are where the coat hanger was twisted together. You can just keep winding these into the coil. We're going to cut it into rings in a minute anyway. I'll use the pliers to wind as much wire into the coil as possible. Now we can remove the coil from the mandrel and cut it into rings. The side cutters will cut this wire, but they need a lot of force on the handles. These Nipex compact bolt cutters make the work much easier. I'm not sponsored by Nipex, I just like this tool. Although if Nipex really want to give me sponsorship money, I'll probably say all kinds of nice things about their tools. A simple frame like this makes it much easier to start a rectangular piece of chain mail. You need to secure it to the bench or it will tip over. I'm using a bamboo skewer for the hanger rod. I'll start by threading 16 closed rings onto the rod. All the remaining rings need to be opened up sideways, like this. Start by making sure all the rings are overlapping in the same direction, then connect the first pair together with a single ring. Now use two pairs of pliers to close the ring. Closing the rings is easier if you have two pairs of short nosed pliers like these. Now slide the next ring across and join it to its neighbour in the same way. Keep repeating this procedure until you've finished the entire second row. Let's pause for a moment and look at what we have. We have two rows of rings. The first row points to the right and the second row points to the left. The first row has 16 rings, and the second row has 15. If we keep working in this pattern, our next row will have 14 rings, then 13, 12, 11 and so on, eventually making a triangle. If you want to make a rectangle instead, you'll need to add an extra ring at the end of each row to maintain the 16 ring width. For the second row, the extra ring needs to be on the left side. For the third row, the extra ring will go on the right side. For now, I'll just start the third row without adding the extra rings. Notice that we only connect the new ring to two rings in the row above it. When we finish the row, all of the non-edge rings in the second row are now connected to four other rings, two in the top row and two in the bottom. Those 12 coat hangers gave us enough rings to make 19 rows of chain mail. Let's take it off the frame for a closer look. It's very flexible and quite heavy for its size. It'd certainly give more protection on the battlefield than naked skin or a cotton shirt, and it'd be very effective against slashing cuts from a knife or a sword. However, these butted links wouldn't work very well against a sharp pointed weapon, like a spear. A strong thrust from this tapered point would open the links up like this, and then you'd have a bad day. A serious medieval knight or man-at-arms wouldn't consider this to be acceptable quality in his chainmail. He'd insist on having the ends of all his chainmail links riveted together, like this. So how do you make riveted links, Mr Tightwad? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. You start with a coiled wire, the same as for butted links. The first difference is that the coils need to have overlapping ends. Obviously our cutter won't be able to skip the first wire to cut just the second one. 
One way around this problem is to grind a notch into the cutter's jaws so that it can skip over the first wire. Another way is to simply open up the coil with a screwdriver. You can also use the cutter's jaws to open up the coil. Once you have enough clearance you can cut the link as usual. We need the links opened up wide like this for the next step anyway. Now we can go into the workshop and light the fire. It's possible to forge these links cold, but heating them first reduces your chances of cracking the metal. I'm using this metal rod in my vise as a rivet anvil. You can see how quickly the wire cools once it touches the anvil. Now we can heat the other side of the ring and flatten it in the same way. Next I'll squeeze the link together with my pliers. Heat it a third time, then hammer the link closed. This gives a nice close fit to the link ends. Next we need to punch a hole for the rivet. We'll use this flat ended punch and this block of steel. The block has a hole drilled in it that's a little bigger than the punch. So we'll heat the ring one more time. Then once the ring's hot, we have to quickly line up the punch, the ring and the hole and hammer the punch through the ring. That punches a nice clean hole through the ring's ends. The tapered punch is fairly easy to remove. So now our ring's ready for riveting. I'll make the rivet from this nail. Insert the nail into the hole, then use your pliers to cut it off as close as possible. Be careful not to drop the rivet while you reposition your pliers. Now hammer the end of the rivet into a dome shape. This operation also makes the rivet expand to fill the inside of the hole. Next, file off any remaining sharp edges. Now you can repeat that process another 30,000 times and you'll have enough rings to make a male hauberk. So if anyone ever asks you to make them a riveted male hauberk, just remember to say... Tightwad Workshop is filmed in front of a live studio audience.